Um, good afternoon. Um, welcome and thank you all for joining us here in the room and in the online. Uh, my name is Aisha Absuri. I am a research fellow at the Middle East Institute. Uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all and to um, take, uh, to kick off our flagship event, ME101 Lecture Series. ME101 Lecture Series uh, aims to give a comprehensive overview of geopolitical, economic, um, uh, sociocultural issues in the Middle East. Executive lectures um, over uh, the next few weeks. Uh, it will take place every Thursday, starting from today, and we will have a wrap-up session um, on the 12th of October. Uh, we we designed uh, the lecture series under two themes, uh, one on the geopolitical competition in the region, and the other theme uh, is uh, on the social and economic uh, challenges uh, in the Middle East. To kick, uh, to kick off uh, the lecture series uh, for today, we will have two segments. Uh, the first segment uh, will be an introduction to the series, and the second one will be the first lecture. So um, to introduce the series uh, uh, of today, uh, we do have um, our uh, senior uh, associate uh, director uh, of the Middle East uh, Institute, Mr. Carl Skedian, who will um, speak about um, why Singapore should care about the developments uh, in the Middle East. And without further ado, I now give the floor to Carl to um, give the introduction to the series. Hey, Tasha, uh, and welcome everyone here and uh, those who are joining us remotely as well. So as Aisha has uh, pointed out, uh, it's been a carefully curated uh, series of lectures um, and uh, designed to make you, well, both answer as well as think about the question about why should Singaporeans care about what happens in the place. Sorry, why should, yeah, why should Singaporeans care? I mean, I noticed that I said Singaporeans rather than Singapore. I'll come back to that in a short while. And uh, borrow a phrase from our chairman uh, who uses it every now and then to, to uh, try and answer this question. He always says that much as we try to ignore the Middle East, the Middle East refuses to ignore us. Uh, that's really pithy and succinct, but I think that for today, if I can, we need to modify that slightly. We ought to say that the Middle East isn't ignoring us, and we cannot ignore the Middle East. So earlier, you remember I made a distinction between Singapore and Singaporeans. Uh, let me explain. As a country, we have set up our, um, you know, we generally not ignore the Middle East. In fact, if anything, we have actually stepped up our diplomatic engagement, business, and other things for well over a decade. In fact, that's the reason, uh, one of the reasons why MEI was established in 2007. But while Singapore moved in this direction, most Singaporeans who are famously or perhaps notoriously very insular have not followed suit. I think one, one odd thing about it is that you can find Singaporeans, you know, in almost every corner of the earth, including the Middle East. But by and large, for many of us here, you know, we don't care too much what happens in Australia. Never mind how it affects us. But I think I want you all to consider the events of the past few years and ask yourselves. Have they impacted you? Not just the events of the Middle East, but around you. Have they impacted you and how? That, that's the first key to unlocking this question. And I think if you just give it a, a fleeting thought, just for a second, you will no doubt realize that uh, when it comes to where it hurts most in you know, your wallets, there's a war in a faraway part of the world that has already had an outsized impact. The next thing I want you to consider is outsides. We have often heard the phrase, and I'm sure uh, Singapore is a yeah. price taker, not a price setter. I don't think it needs much elaboration to accept to reiterate that we are not immune to things 
that happened to us elsewhere. I mean, we're a small country. Uh, things that happen, not just in our region, but around the world, have an outsized impact. Then there's a third, perhaps more current reason I agree with consider. I think recently, uh, yeah, I, I think if, you, if you've been following the news and perhaps you should, you know, you worry, people have realized that many of our leaders have come back to this team uh, about how the global system is coming under siege. Or oh, it is at some critical juncture or some variant of that feels. Let me just quote two examples and just just this week. The first, uh, our Deputy Prime Minister Lawrence Form on Monday is that, that there's a change in the global consensus around free trade and win win economic cooperation. The logic of interdependence used to prevail. So we need to think hard about how we continue to strengthen our system of trade and investment. So, as, as you will undoubtedly know, in, in exactly two weeks, we will have an election here in Singapore. Things are heating up, you know, people are talking every day. But, uh, you know, I mean, amid all the talk about reserves, uh, you know, uh, how a candidate is independent or is not, etc. Uh, we heard one of the candidates, um, Sataman, talk about how he intends to act if he wins the election. Um, in essence, he said that. In response to the troubling state of global affairs, he is deeply concerned about Singapore. So those are just two examples just this week. The third will likely come this Sunday when the Prime Minister delivers his National Day Rally, the most important uh, political speech of the year. Uh, there is always um, a foreign co component to the speech, so I hope you listen and take note of that. Basically, all these three points come to my fact. The world has an outsized impact on this, and the Middle East is no exception. And uh, if you pay attention to what's happening, you will be able to discern the threats and how all these connect to each other. And that brings me to the uh, purpose of anyone who help you discern the threats and connect the Middle East to us and us to the Middle East. I said earlier that a series of lectures has been carefully created and uh, handed to uh, Aisha and Misha for putting together the program. Uh, in essence, they both uh, look for answers to the question we are posing now why should we care? And as she said, we divided it into two parts the geopolitical competition in the Indies and the challenges in each of the cases. I don't think I see, need to say much about the geopolitical competition. In Southeast Asia, we are, we are living in the thick of very serious competition between the US and China. Uh, it's enough to say that in the Middle East, we are beginning to experience what we have done for many years. And if you've been following the events there, you, know, uh, you will know that some sort of detente is breaking out in the region, that being the Abraham talks. Recent deal between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Turkey is also trying to bridge bridges with others. Uh, and you know, of late, there's been a lot of talk about how even uh, Saudi Arabia and Israel might have a form of uh, There's some skepticism about it, but um, stranger things have happened. But perhaps of uh, greater significance are other changes that are taking place. We know that uh, for Singaporeans, we know that climate change is an existential challenge. And uh, one key facet of this is how we and the rest of the world are going to wean ourselves off oil and gas, something that's synonymous with this. And how the big uh, exporters in the Gulf will, will, will deal with this issue. Singapore is a petrol chemical hub, so it's clear that our jobs will be affected. We famously watch every three months when the Energy Market Authority releases a uh, forecast for whether our electricity bills are going to go up and down. So most of the last two years, we've been you know, airing our hair out, or what's left of our hair out, in my case. Um, so, it's our pockets, jobs, and other things that will be affected. 
Yeah, you know, I mean, there's also a plus side. We are also actually doing research, and then uh, looking into renewable energy. New Deal is going to be, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of studies describe it as a region that's going to be worsened by the effects of climate change. I recently read a book, The Heat Will Kill Us. And the first thing you think about when it comes to heat, you know, the desert and the Middle East, right? So, uh, you know, we can say that they have some, you know, some uh, pretty big impetus to get going on this, and we can benefit you know, our tie up with them. Many MOUs have been signed with some with various countries into the aspects of hydrogen and uh, renewable energy and things like that if they come to fruition. Now, uh, you know, I mean, we can say that, you know, depending on who you ask, I mean, I should ask the climate change expert, maybe anybody. Depending on who you ask, we can say the end of oil and gas might be within the site. Uh, and, you know, I mean, some interesting changes are also happening in Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and some other countries they have started to think about how they're going to deal with this future without the oil riches. And how they're going to buy football teams and the entire team players to come over without the money and all of the wealth. Uh, many of them are planning to do what we have already done. I mean, global financial center, upskilling for knowledge based economy. You know, the UAE even has plans for an integrated resort. So you can have see what they But at some point, I don't know how long it's taken. Then some people will provide you an answer later. Singapore Airlines and Qatar Airlines have been neck and neck in the competition for world's best airline for the last few years. It keeps going back and forth. I think uh, Qatar's airport. Is also among those that's frequently mentioned in the same breath as Changi and Kong. So there's competition, right? Uh, and, uh, but it's not zero sum. We are competing with them. They want to want to eat our lunch, to be sure. But uh, it's not a zero sum. There's also opportunity. We have a good brand name, a Singapore brand is recognized the world over. Um, and all of us are willing to. Uh, to go to, to other countries, to seek our fortunes, give our advice, help when we can. And so all this opens up new opportunities for us as well. Maybe in, in a few years, some of you might be working in the dark. But I think uh, if we do, I have a good advice for you. Protect yourself in the elements. The projected temperature in the UAE today will be the high of 49 degrees centigrade. Well, Relative humidity at 18 percent. The wet bulb temperature is going to be above 30 degrees. That's in the danger zone of humans. Now, you know, in order to uh, transform the economies, the, the, the country, the communities also have to transform the societies. I think it's something that's very important to us. And the best part of watching. Of course, the main targets for these changes are the populations themselves. Uh, the Gulf region, much of the Middle East actually is uh, in a good position. It has what we call a demographic need. A lot of people are rich, wealthy, you know. Right? So, when you give it dividend, you know, I mean, that means you have a young, energetic population. Contrasted, contrasted with Singapore, you're going to be super aged, not just the aged society, the genetic, you know, must just seven, seven years old. Um, and so, you know, I mean, the, the changes that the Gulf countries and others are making have a lot to do with fulfilling the aspirations of the younger populations. The kind of lives they want to lead, the jobs they want to have, and so on. I, I don't know whether you follow the news, but last weekend uh, a Barbie opened up in Saudi Arabia. Uh, that, that's uh, unthinkable. A few years ago, you couldn't watch a movie in Saudi Arabia, let alone Barbie, which has been banned. In, Several countries, including Kobe. Now in Saudi Arabia, you can even go to a rave concert. I think some uh, famous American singers and all that have gone there and had concerts. All this is unthinkable of this pretty short. So, I mean, that's in, in, in one sense that their own populations, and they want to make sure that the countries are attractive, can fulfill the dreams of their young people, and so on. Uh, but there's a lot of dimension to this. Uh, Arabia is the first place in Pakistan. Singapore, Indonesia, and Malaysia. Indonesia and Malaysia are the majority countries. 
And their practices have percolated to this region in the past. And so these changes, um, it is worth watching to see whether there will be or be affected somehow as well. But that's another way we should do, why we should pay attention to this. Apart from the other populations, the own populations, I mean, there's no reason that the countries themselves and elsewhere are making all these changes. It's to make themselves attractive to foreign talent. I think some in Singapore are still at this term, but there's no doubting that uh, we are in a race for global talent. Right? And uh, we need to continue to make sure we have quality image, attracting the kind of people here who can help us to innovate, uh, start up new companies, create new jobs, and provide the kind of lives that Singaporeans want. And in the sense that we have competition, we need to see what the competition does in order for us to do better. And it's not just the uh, Israel is known as a startup nation. Singapore is on, has, has often been called the uh, innovation nation. Everyone knows lots of new ones that I imagine. We do things differently from the students, but I mean, there's no doubt that we compare this. We how to build this culture of innovation, entrepreneurship, and all that. Which is, um, I think in the last innovation cities in the next uh, a month ago, in the next seven, which is an incredible feat, you know, considering our small size and considering that you know, this innovation drive is not exactly the same thing. But I think today Israel headlines for another different reason, you know, a growing fight over what kind of country we want. We ought to uh, keep abreast of developments there. Uh, we will, you know, we are in the midst of something called Forward Singapore, you know, which charts out the kind of country we want to be in a few years. So we want to keep the rest of the development there and learn from what is happening. Egypt, Jordan, Iran, Turkey, you know, fantastic uh, things going on there, important things, all of these will uh, impact us in some way or other. So it's not just the dull of the digital which we often talk about, you know, as if they're almost exclusive. To the Gulf, I mean, to the Middle East. There are things happening in Egypt and elsewhere that are also of great importance and interest to us. Sharon uh, always reminds me that I have to keep to 15 minutes. I'm going to break the rules a little bit and indulge in maybe another one or two minutes' time. Uh, we often say that Singapore will make friends with anybody as long as they want to make friends with us. Police is no exception. Mm -hmm. If anything, it's becoming more and more important to us, creating opportunities to grow our economy, enlarge our diplomatic space, and jointly tackle some of the most pressing issues we face. We have signed a lot of agreements on renewable energy, but we also signed agreements on things like cyber security, okay? getting to be more and more, and more important to, to us now even as a very, very plugged in country. But I, I mean, I, I don't want to, to test your patience anymore beyond the 15 minutes that I've wanted. I think it's still one day left. So I will just remind you that there are nine sessions of um, As Aisha pointed out, we have carefully created the two broad areas. Uh, the first eight will hopefully help you pull the threads together. And the ninth, if we have questions after that, um, it's going to be a free form. So I think we're trying to make it so at least 75% of the sessions. And I encourage uh, you know, like minded people like yourselves to either come here in person. I know it's a little bit out of the game, but uh, you know, you can, uh, join us remotely on the Zoom. Um, you know, I'm going to the whole gamut of, of, of things that uh, are being tackled, especially the one that you should care about. So, uh, let me welcome you once again. I hope you'll find it interesting and uh, engaging and enlightening.
I'll now hand over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Jean Luc Saman, a senior research fellow, uh, who will talk about uh, the great power competition in the Middle East. And this uh, session will be moderated by my other colleague, Dr. Clemens Chi, who's a research fellow at Kenya. Right, thank you very much. And I hope you find it a um, fulfilling exercise. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the opening remarks delivered by our senior associate director, Mr. Carl Spagan. Um, and welcome to the first lecture of the ME101 series organized by the Middle East Institute, MEI. My name is Clemens Che, a research fellow at the Institute, and I will be today's moderator. Uh, the opening theme of this series revolves around great power competition or geopolitical competition, as was introduced earlier on. Uh, on which today's presentation will elaborate with reference to the foreign policy agenda of the United States, Russia, and China, and how rivalries among these powers have an impact on the Middle East. So recent trends in the region have indicated in particular that the Gulf Arab states are weaning themselves away from over-dependence on Washington by engaging with a variety of other partners, and this pattern accompanies a flurry of Chinese diplomatic initiatives in the Middle East, and these are aimed at drawing countries closer to Beijing's orbit. In April last year, the six Gulf states also abstained and vote in a vote to suspend Russia from the UN Human Rights Council. And amid the ongoing Russia-Ukraine conflict, interestingly, Dubai has become a wartime power for the Russians. So it is against such a backdrop that my colleague, Dr. John Lu Saman, will deliver today's lecture and I'll provide a, an introduction of his profile. Uh, Dr. Saman is a senior research fellow at MEI and his latest book entitled New Military Strategies in the Gulf was just released a week ago and many congratulations on that. His profile rests on a wealth of experience on the Middle East and his strategic affairs ranging from security issues to things like Israel's, Israeli security and Hezbollah relationship with Hezbollah. His extensive experience in the military domain is also proven by his positions at the NATO Defense College from 2011 to 16, and also later at the UAE National Defense College from 2016 to 21 as an associate professor in strategic studies. So without further ado, please allow me to hand it over to my colleague John. Thank you very much, Clements, uh, and uh, uh, and I think you can now see the the slides. Is there an echo of the microphone? Maybe we cannot have uh, both. Yeah, the same time. Uh, okay, so I'll uh, go directly to the topic of the day, which uh, which is as Clements uh, uh, mentioned, the uh, great great power competition. So. Okay. Uh, so great power competition, looking at the, the let's say the triangle between the US, uh, China, uh, and Russia. And I have basically three objectives with this lecture. And obviously, uh, uh, due to the time constraint, uh, I won't get into all the details of the policies of those three countries in the region. But what I'd like you to uh, think about for the next uh, 40, 45 minutes of this lecture uh, is three things. The first is the return of the narrative. Uh, because today, and maybe even more in Singapore, Southeast Asia, uh, great power competition is everywhere. We discuss that uh, in the media, in uh, uh, any discussion at the US or elsewhere. Uh, but this is rather new or at least a recent phenomenon in the Middle East. Uh, for a while, uh, it wasn't uh, the, the central theme in the Middle East. I mean, most of the things that happened in the Middle East in the last 20 years related to terrorism, the so-called war on terror that led the US to uh, uh, wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, and most recently uh, to the coalition against the Islamic State. So what we are seeing in the last five years is the return of the narrative. It's not completely new. 
is the return. Return, why? Because uh, we, uh, if we look at the historical perspective, there was this great power competition back in the Cold War era. It was mostly not only uh, between the US and the USSR. China didn't really play a role. I'll come back to that later. But that's the first thing that I would like us to keep in mind uh, for our discussion. The second thing is great power competition and, and, and the Middle East should be conceived as a two-way street. And that will be also one thing that I uh, explained here, uh, which is that the great powers, so here when we talk about the great powers, we'll be talking about these three countries, US, Russia, and China. Um, they have their agendas, they have their policies that are shaping uh, the competition in the, in the region, but obviously uh, local actors also have their own agents, and they will also use this great power competition as left to play one against the other. Uh, and that's something we should not forget, that this is not just uh, great powers projecting their competition in the Middle East, and the Middle East is just a passive actor in all of that. That's more complex. Uh, finally, one thing which I'd like us to do systematically here is to question how we measure power. Uh, because there's a lot of discussions about China becoming a major player in the Middle East, China replacing the U.S. And I think uh, if we want to go beyond the media uh, discourse, the media narrative, we need to uh, look at how do we measure uh, that power. Uh, the most, uh, the simplest way to measure power uh, here, I would say, is what we call the time model, which is to look at the diplomatic engagement. Uh, what is the uh, influence in terms of foreign policy, in terms of uh, diplomacy uh, by these great powers in the region? The second aspect is information. Uh, how is this country uh, influential in terms of shaping uh, the narrative, the information that is provided to the public opinion in terms of perceptions? The third one is maybe the most old-fashioned way to measure power, which is the military. Uh, when we discuss the US, China, uh, Russia, uh, how many soldiers do they have in the Middle East? Uh, how uh, many uh, weapon systems are they selling to uh, the region? And so on. And finally, another way uh, which is uh, uh, very important is the economy. And this might be also uh, the most obvious one, which is trade how important trade is uh, for those countries in relations to the Middle East. Having said that, I'm going to start with the US uh, because uh, my main argument, uh, I'll say it, uh, from the beginning, is that the US uh, is still, uh, for the near future, uh, the biggest uh, power in the region and that uh, uh, I don't believe, and I'm not the, one, the only one on this, uh, no, I don't believe that the Ch China is in the process of replacing uh, the U.S. in the Middle East anytime soon. Uh, to understand the current state of U.S. policy in the region, we need to uh, go back into history and to look at what are the priorities and what is what shaped the uh, uh, U.S. policy in the region. Uh, in Singapore, when we talk about the Middle East, we tend to look first and foremost uh, uh, at the goals. In the US, when we talk about the Middle East, it's first and foremost about Israel. That's the first element that comes into the discussion. And that relates to a special relationship that the US uh, has been cultivating uh, with Israel uh, for the past, uh, past decades. That relationship didn't start right after the creation of Israel in 1948. At first, actually, the uh, US uh, administration, the US government, uh, was uh, skeptical about the uh, Israeli project. It was actually the USSR that recognized Israel before uh, the US. Eventually, the ties between Israel and the US grew in the early 60s. Here, this is a picture of the first visit uh, of uh, David Ben Gurion on the on the left uh, to the White House in 1960, visiting President Eisenhower uh, for the first time, just before Eisenhower 
was replaced uh, by uh, John Kennedy. Uh, this is really the, this, the, the first, the starting point of that special relationship. Uh, that relationship turned also into a military relationship. We'll, I'll come back to that just to give you some numbers, but Israel today, for the past uh, several decades, has been the first recipient of U.S. military aid. We're talking about $3 billion, uh, dollars, uh, roughly speaking, uh, each year. Um, so that's the first point. The second point is what we call the Carter Doctrine and dual continuum. So this relates to Jimmy Carter, who was a uh, U.S. president in the late 70s. And during one of his final speeches, the uh, State of the Union in uh, uh, January uh, 1980, Carter expl explained that any threat in the, uh, to the Strait of Homes in the Persian Gulf, any uh, disruption of the, uh, the maritime uh, communication lines uh, in that area would be considered as a threat to the U.S. security interests. In other words, uh, Carter was articulating for the first time the idea that the stability of the Gulf is the U.S. national security interest. And that's something quite significant. The idea that uh, what's happening in the Gulf is not just a matter for the Gulf, it's a matter for the U.S. because of the economic interest uh, for the U.S., but uh, or eventually also it becomes a secret interest. This led uh, to the idea that the U.S. has to provide security stability for the region. Uh, three years after that speech by Carter, the U.S. Central Command uh, was created. I'll come back to that. This is the military command in charge of operations in the Middle East, and which uh, in some ways has been the most active uh, regional command uh, of uh, U.S. forces uh, over the past three decades. In addition to, the, to this doctrine, there was the idea of dual containment. Dual containment meaning containment of two countries, Iran, which after the 79 became an Islamic uh, Republic, and Iraq, which at that time was governed by Saddam Hussein. We would argue that now it's uh, a, one single containment, because Iraq, uh, under the regime of Saddam Hussein, collapsed after the invasion of uh, the U.S. in 2003. But this idea of containing any uh, regional power is still uh, relevant. Uh, the third point which I wanted to make is what we've seen in the 2000s, the so-called neoconservative moment. Uh, and uh, for those uh, of you who may be too young to remember this period, uh, after 9-11, after the attacks uh, of 2001 against the uh, U.S., you had a strong uh, movement within U.S. government uh, that believed that democracy, uh, the lack of democracy in the Middle East was the issue, that uh, the, la the lack of democracy led to authoritarianism, led to radicalization. And as a result, the neoconservatives who were uh, present in the Bush administration at that time promoted the idea of uh, spreading the democracy model in the area. This, in, this was obviously to start with Iraq in 2003, but eventually that uh, completely uh, failed. This was maybe one of the most ambitious moments, uh, for good or bad reasons, uh, in terms of U.S. interventions in the Middle East. Uh, and because it was the most ambitious moment, this led to another period that we are still living, I would say today, which is a moment of U.S. fatigue. The U.S., uh, starting under Obama, later on with Trump, and now with Biden, wants at any cost to disengage from the Middle East. Obama was the first to express it. Uh, he said uh, during the campaign in 2008 that it's time to do nation building at, at home. Uh, in other words, to stop nation building in the Middle East and to do it at home. Trump said it in a less sophisticated way uh, by uh, proclaiming the idea of America first, but that's 
that was the same uh, mindset to decrease the presence of the U.S. from the region. Biden is, in a way, following the same narrative, the idea that the U.S. should uh, reduce or should uh, recalibrate its presence in the uh, Middle East. And as of now, if you want to understand uh, what is the, 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 the uh, strategy of the U.S. in, in the Middle East, uh, one good way is to, to check, uh, and most of these the speeches are uh, available online, is to check the, the hearings uh, in, in front of Congress of members of the uh, Biden administration. And usually when it comes to the Middle East, uh, in the last three, four years, there have been three clear priorities. Counterterrorism, and here uh, this includes uh, uh, the Islamic State, this includes Al Qaeda, so uh, nothing new. This has been one of the key priorities over the last uh, uh, three decades. It includes Iran, uh, and that's also nothing, nothing new. I mean, uh, the uh, issue of Iran since 1979 uh, has always been at the top of the uh, US agenda in the Middle East. But something that was added very recently, and which was added at the end of the Trump administration, is very power combination. And this is, uh, this is clearly uh, the, the, the novelty here, the fact that the US now considers that one of its strategic priorities in the Middle East is this great power competition. And here they include uh, uh, Russia as well as uh, China. Now, as I said earlier, what's important for us is to measure power and to have, have the ability to quantify it. Uh, this is uh, um, a breakdown of US troops uh, in the region as of 2023. So I checked uh, yesterday the, uh, the military balance, which is this annual, annual survey of uh, armed forces uh, in the world. And roughly you have about 40, 40,000 uh, US troops in the Middle East. Uh, most of these troops are actually in the Gulf, uh, with Kuwait and Qatar having the biggest, uh, biggest uh, military bases. Uh, in the case of Kuwait, you could argue that this is uh, a legacy uh, of the invasion of Kuwait uh, in 1990 uh, by Iran. But this is still quite significant. I mean, as I said, the U.S. talks about disengagement, and the world uh, sees or perceives the U.S. as a, uh, this country that wants to uh, uh, get out of the Middle East. But we're talking about uh, a country that still has about 40,000 troops. Keep in mind also that there are ongoing operations. Uh, in Syria, you still have uh, hundreds of troops uh, from the U.S., which are conducting the operation inherent to resolve which is this operation targeting the Islamic State. Uh, I included also troops in Turkey, uh, which are part of uh, US troops, which are technically part of Europe, because uh, in, the, uh, in, the US, uh, uh, in the US way to uh, uh, categorize the Middle East, uh, Turkey is uh, in Europe as a NATO country. Uh, in addition to that, this is just uh, a picture, uh, a map of uh, the Middle East and the military bases. Do not really take uh, the numbers of troops uh, because this this is a, a map from 2019. So the, the numbers are not uh, updated. But I think what's interesting for us here is the locations. The fact that the, the US military is basically everywhere, almost everywhere in the region. So I think it's uh, a map that tells you about uh, how uh, the, the US military footprint is still uh, relevant uh, today. As I said earlier, uh, the, uh, the key also when it comes to the US Israel uh, relationship, this special relationship, is the military aid. Historically, there were two pillars uh, to U.S. aid to Israel. There was a military pillar and an economic pillar. But as it was said uh, in an introduction by uh, our uh, deputy director, Carl, uh, Israel is a, now a big economy, a vibrant economy. So uh, it stopped receiving economic aid uh, from the U.S. for a long time. 
all the, the US aid to Israel now is uh, for uh, military uh, purposes. We're talking about uh, three thousand three billion three hundred million uh, dollars, uh, which is very significant, obviously, for any country. Uh, in addition to that, uh, you have also uh, U.S. Uh, U.S. support to Israel's missile defense uh, uh, initiatives, such as uh, I won't do. So this is for uh, the U.S. Now let's move to uh, uh, the second uh, big player uh, in the area, and that is uh, China. Uh, China is a relatively newcomer uh, in uh, the Middle East. Uh, I, I hear a lot of people, uh, especially in Singapore, insisting that China has been in the Middle East for a long time. But it, this was insignificant at the strategic level. Uh, one of the, the, the key indicators is that most of the countries in the region actually recognize uh, China or the PRC uh, only in 1990. Uh, most of the countries uh, in the world, for instance, recognized China at that time. Uh, and uh, Israel actually did it uh, uh, the first in, uh, I, if I remember correctly, in the 1950. But what's in, important for us is that the strategic dimension of the relationship between China and the Middle East really grew uh, in the last decade. And you could argue that there was a cheating being in effect. Uh, there was a clear a momentum after uh, he rose to power in 2013. Uh, and this was related uh, first and foremost uh, to the economic uh, dimension and infrastructure and uh, digital uh, networks. There are different aspects here. To, uh, first, uh, the, the, the biggest uh, partner at first in the, the region was Israel. Uh, Huawei, uh, until today, has one unique research and development center in the area, and that is in Israel. Because China uh, looked uh, at the Israeli tech industry, and in particular, uh, to the uh, uh, to the startup uh, ecosystem in Tel Aviv uh, as a, a very uh, important partner. So uh, we've seen in the last years China investing and China buying uh, several uh, is Israeli tech companies, in particular in the cybersecurity domain. That obviously led to tensions, because if you remember, I just said, Israel has this special relationship uh, with uh, the US. That uh, led uh, the US to wonder how far uh, Israel is willing to go with China in that uh, domain. Uh, and that's something that has been also uh, on the agenda for the Gulf uh, countries. Uh, you have six uh, members of the Gulf Cooperation Council. So Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, uh, Qatar, Oman, uh, Kuwait, the United Arab Emirates. All these countries have selected Huawei for the development of their 5G network. Uh, and they got uh, pressure from the US from the beginning to not uh, select a Huawei, but they, uh, they insisted on doing so. Uh, that's uh, a significant uh, decision. This this is the reason, for instance, here I took uh, this picture. Uh, you may recognize Burj Khalifa in Dubai uh, celebrating Huawei. I don't think you will see that in a lot of U.S. Uh, partners uh, across the world. Uh, I don't think you can see that anywhere in Europe and in, in the Middle East. Uh, you, it's probably only in the uh, UAE uh, these days that you would see that. And that shows you how uh, things are changing. Uh, the fact that this uh, Chinese presence uh, is, is becoming uh, obvious uh, in all domains. Uh, in addition to that, and the map might be a bit uh, difficult to see in the back, uh, but one thing which I wanted to show also with this map uh, is the fact that China is involved in the uh, ports infrastructures in the region. Uh, in, it's present in several Gulf uh, ports infrastructures, 
China uh, or Chinese entities uh, have invested uh, in Abu Dhabi port, in uh, Hamad port in Qatar, uh, in Dukun port in Oman, uh, and maybe more importantly, in Haifa port in Israel. It's why I say more importantly, because in Haifa port, next to uh, the uh, uh, civilian merchant side of Haifa port, you have a military uh, site, a naval facility in Haifa, where the US Navy uh, regularly uh, visits. And obviously, the US Navy was not really happy to hear and to, hear, to learn that uh, from now on, Haifa port would be operated by a Chinese entity. This is also a, a significant uh, phenomenon, significant trend. Uh, until now, uh, Israel, despite threats from the U.S. Navy that they would cease visiting Haifa, uh, Israel did not uh, cancel uh, its partnership uh, with China on uh, this the management of the port. In addition to that, uh, as I said, this became first and foremost about economy, about trade, and uh, for a long time. Uh, if you were asking people uh, in the US, they were dismissing that uh, Chinese presence, saying this is just about business, this is just about oil, uh, there isn't anything strategic here. Except that uh, in the past five years, we saw uh, China uh, raising its profile in the military domain as well. Uh, it's about mostly on sales until now, uh, and we're talking about uh, drones. Here, this is a drone, uh, one of the drones that uh, China has been selling to Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Uh, China has also been selling uh, ballistic missiles to Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Uh, actually, Saudi Arabia started uh, buying Chinese ballistic missiles in the 80s, even before recognizing the PRC. Uh, but on the, on the, the next uh, picture, you have uh, the uh, light uh, training fighter jet from China that uh, the UAE announced uh, that it would uh, buy uh, last year. This is unprecedented. This is the first time a world country which usually buys uh, Western fighter jets, either British, French, or American fighter jets, would buy a Chinese fighter jet. This is a light uh, training fighter jet, so nothing compared to uh, uh, an American F-35 or a French Papa, but still, this is a big message, a big signal. Uh, and most recently, you may have seen, this was uh, mentioned in the South China Morning Post, uh, the UAE and China will, uh, will organize their first joint military drill. And this is uh, a significant step. So we see that more and more uh, China is becoming a military actor. Now, uh, as I said, we need to quantify all of this. So uh, this is just a snapshot of Saudi Arabia uh, arms imports. Uh, I don't have time to go to all the countries in the region, but Saudi Arabia be, be, being the you know, the country that spends the biggest uh, amount on the defense, I think this is the most relevant piece. This is the breakdown uh, of arms suppliers uh, to uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, if you look at the last column, so the total uh, over the last decade, uh, one, one thing that is the most obvious is that the United States is by far uh, the uh, biggest, uh, uh, the biggest uh, suppliers, uh, followed uh, by France. Uh, what's remarkable here is that uh, China is not even on the top three. Uh, it's not on the podium. Uh, you have uh, here uh, the United Kingdom, you have Germany, uh, and then you have uh, China. So Germany, which, by the way, uh, was uh, very reluctant about uh, arms sales with, uh, with Saudi Arabia after the Khashoggi uh, affair, uh, still is a, a major supplier and a bigger supplier of uh, weaponry to Saudi Arabia than China. 
So it tells you about uh, the scale uh, of the answers we're talking about. This is, in a way, over. Uh, so this is uh, for the military. Finally, a, a thing on the diplomatic dimension for uh, China, because this is also something uh, quite significant. Uh, in particular, uh, as mentioned earlier, the fact that for the first time, China brokered the deal uh, between Saudi Arabia and Iran last month. This is a, a, a rather new uh, thing, and it tells us about how China wants to play a role in the, uh, in the region, uh, but we have to, uh, to wait because until now, there has, no, there has been no significant uh, achievement since that deal between Saudi Arabia and Iran. There were uh, big speculations that this could lead to uh, a settlement of the conflict in Yemen. Uh, unfortunately, until now, there has not been uh, any serious breakthrough on this one. Uh, let me move very quickly uh, to uh, the third act, Russia. Uh, and I would clearly put Russia in a different category because Russia is not uh, a great power in the same way that um, the US and uh, China. You will see here the reasons. And that's why I, I, I would call Russia a spoiler in the Middle East. It has the ability uh, to uh, challenge uh, the uh, status quo, but it doesn't have the ability to replace uh, the US. And it doesn't have uh, the ability uh, to follow the trajectory of China. Some of the reasons for that, I mean, Russia has a limited diplomatic and trade presence. It's not a big trade partner uh, of the region. Uh, and in terms of diplomatic influence, uh, it is relatively uh, modest. Uh, that's a legacy of the Cold War. The Gulf states, in particular, uh, were uh, for uh, U.S. during the Cold War. So as a result, Russia was not uh, was not a strong diplomatic partner even after uh, the end of the Cold War. Uh, this is also something that you see at the military level. Uh, most of the presence, the, the biggest presence uh, of Russia in the region is in Syria. Uh, here you have a map where you see uh, the two uh, locations, naval base and air base of uh, uh, Russia uh, in, uh, inside Syria. And I'll come back to that because a lot of the uh, Israeli policy when it comes to uh, Russia is driven by the Russian presence in Syria. Because when you're Israel, if you see the presence of uh, uh, Russia inside Syria, that plays a major role in how you consider uh, your Russia policy. Having said that, there is a significant presence of Russia at the information uh, level. And I would argue that this is, uh, uh, this is the added value of Russia, probably more than China, which is not really visible in terms of media uh, coverage in uh, the Middle East, uh, or uh, the US. Uh, Russia today, or Russia uh, in uh, Arabic, is a, a very important uh, player when it comes to the media in the region. A lot of the, a lot of the, um, uh, a lot of the Arab public uh, will uh, watch or read uh, the website, and this is uh, this is a significant uh, asset for Russia to spread its narrative when it comes to the war in Syria, but also more recently to the war in Ukraine. Uh, you could argue that uh, the role that Russia today plays, uh, the US has never been able to do that. The US developed its own Arabic channel, uh, al Qurriya, uh, but that never uh, reached the level of uh, success that Russia today uh, has gained uh, in the Arab world. That's, uh, I think, uh, the uh, uh, interesting thing about the Russian presence. In addition to that, uh, there's Putin's appeal in the Middle East. Uh, Putin is seen as a very popular figure. When you do check the polls uh, in uh, Arab countries, uh, Putin is usually uh, receiving positive uh, reviews. Uh, this is uh, on the left a map of Cairo, uh, where uh, during the visits of uh, uh, President Putin, 
uh, with a message of uh, welcome in Arabic. And here on the right, uh, you have uh, a, a picture, which I think is a, a, an important one, which is uh, the G20 summit, right after the Khashoggi uh, assassination. You may remember that journalists from Saudi Arabia that were beheaded inside the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. Uh, one month later, you have uh, the G20 summit. Uh, Mohammed bin Salman, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, uh, is persona non grata. Nobody in the, the Western uh, governments wants to meet with him. They all consider his toxic. The only head of state that goes directly to Mohammed bin Salman ten, uh, ten, uh, one month after the assassination of Khashoggi and gives him a high five is Vladimir Putin. And I think this tells you about uh, also the level, the importance of the personality and uh, uh, how uh, uh, Putin was able uh, to build uh, personal ties uh, with the leaders in the region. And that explains why, until today, there's a, a rather sympathetic or positive view of Putin in the region. Now, to conclude on, uh, on this uh, uh, overview of great power competition in the Middle East, that I said it's a two-way street, and that's the reason why I, I wanted to add uh, one section on how Middle East looks at the uh, great power outage. And there are several scenes here. The first one is that the Middle East, and when I say the Middle East, the Arab countries, uh, Iran or uh, Israel, all consider China as a strategic partner. They don't want to dismiss the presence of China. They, they, none of the countries in the region uh, oppose uh, the presence of, of China. The reason being that uh, they consider China as a major country that you cannot afford to ignore. Uh, the, this is uh, something that I will tell you about the, uh, the perception uh, of the public uh, in uh, the Arab world. And it might be difficult for you uh, uh, in the back to see, but what's important here uh, is that our public opinion has generally a more favorable view of China than of the US. That's, uh, that could be uh, shocking, the fact that the US is the most uh, uh, present uh, power in the region, but at the same time, uh, the public has a better opinion of China. That means that when you have uh, Arab leaders uh, uh, announcing new partnerships with China, this is not uh, going against uh, the perception of the public. It's, you can argue that this will rally the public opinion because uh, the perception is that China uh, is in a better position to than uh, the US. Uh, so here you see the question uh, uh, to the public was, uh, is the U.S. or China a critical threat? And usually uh, it's the U.S. which is seen as a bigger threat. So again, that's, uh, that's something uh, to be worried about if you're uh, U.S. Uh, to be. So this is uh, with regards to, uh, to China and the role of perceptions. Uh, when it comes to uh, the Middle East and the war in Ukraine, you have similar phenomenon. Uh, from the beginning, the Middle Eastern countries considered that the war in Ukraine was the war of the West, uh, that this was another conflict, uh, this was a conflict between Russia and Western countries, and they had no, um, no, no interest in joining one side against another. Uh, this is the uh, uh, same thing here, the, the, the perception uh, of Russia in the world, and you can see that the Middle East here is not very different from uh, uh, from Asia or uh, Africa. It joins uh, probably most of the most of the countries in the world uh, by by arguing for neutrality. Uh, this is the perception, but at the level of policy. Uh, this is more complicated, obviously, because initially 
uh, countries uh, in the region wanted to maintain that neutrality. Both countries do not apply sanctions, for instance, uh, against Russia. Uh, as uh, Clemens mentioned uh, in his introduction, uh, they maintained the diplomatic uh, posture uh, rather, uh, rather favorable to Russia within the UN. But more and more, we saw them uh, understanding that they cannot uh, really, uh, we cannot maintain that uh, neutrality. Uh, Israel, in particular, uh, after the being extremely quiet at first, eventually supported uh, Ukraine uh, and uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, which was for a long time uh, hesitant and reluctant to play uh, a role on Ukraine, eventually uh, welcomed uh, uh, President Zelensky uh, to uh, Saudi Arabia uh, at the last uh, Arab League summit. Uh, and most recently organized uh, a, a summit uh, which uh, on Ukraine in uh, Saudi Arabia. So we see that uh, the Middle East is uh, coming to the re realization that it's quite difficult to stay neutral uh, on Ukraine and that the more the conflict uh, uh, continues, the more they have to, uh, uh, to choose a side. And that at the end of the day, uh, Russia is not their uh, biggest partner. Uh, the U.S. is uh, by far their biggest security partner. This uh, leads me to a, a final point here, which is U.S. primacy. Uh, a lot of the uh, calculus, a lot, a lot of the uh, uh, strategy of Middle Eastern countries today, vis-a-vis -vis the great power competition, uh, uh, relates to the idea that U.S. primacy is ending, that the, the era of U.S. leadership is over. Uh, this is based on things which are which have been said by the U.S. As mentioned earlier, the U.S. has made no secret that it has new priorities for its commitments. Uh, the U.S. wants to uh, shift to uh, uh, the uh, Indo-Pacific, uh, and the war in Ukraine is also putting new priorities in Europe rather than uh, in the Middle East. This is also the realization from Middle Eastern countries that the U.S. is no longer involved on some key diplomatic fronts. Uh, two examples here, Lebanon. Uh, Lebanon has been uh, suffering from a major uh, economy political crisis uh, in the last years, and the U.S. has hardly uh, shown uh, a major interest uh, in solving uh, the Lebanese crisis. Same thing for Palestine. Uh, if you check uh, the uh, statements from the White House, anytime there's a conflict between Israel and Palestinian organizations such as Hamas, most of the time it's all about Israel's security and there's no real effort or no real appetite in the US to uh, relaunch uh, peace efforts, in a sense that the U.S. Uh, lost interest and lost confidence that there could be a window of opportunity for a peace process between Israel and the Palestinians. Uh, and this finally relates to something that we'll be discussing in other uh, lectures, which is that Middle East powers now want also uh, to dictate their foreign policy on their own terms. And that's their quest for strategic autonomy. They want to be able to decide for themselves. They are more and more uh, reluctant to accept U.S. Uh, guidance, U.S. leadership. So they are also uh, playing yeah, the card of uh, uh, the declining uh, U.S. presence, because that also uh, serves their own agenda. So uh, this is my last slide, the takeaways, before we uh, 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 move to the Q&A session. Uh, four main takeaways. Uh, the first one is that no matter what we think about U.S. disengagement, uh, the uh, new priorities uh, from Washington, the U.S. remains the biggest power in the Middle East, uh, though its focus is clearly increased. But if you compare, relatively speaking, there's nothing uh, at the moment that can match the U.S. presence in the Middle East. Uh, 
China uh, is not at the moment expressing uh, the ambition to, uh, to match uh, that military footprint uh, or that diplomatic footprint. Uh, so this is the reason why I say it's still the biggest problem. Having said that, uh, China is clearly uh, raising its profile so that uh, not only at the economic domain, but also in the military and diplomatic uh, dimensions. Uh, and uh, the, the, you know, the deal uh, that uh, China negotiated with Saudi Arabia and Iran is something that, uh, to be fair, was not conceivable a few years ago. That's not something that uh, experts would have considered seriously, uh, that you would have uh, Saudi and the Iranian foreign ministers uh, going to Beijing to sign an agreement. Uh, Russia's influence remains objectively limited. As I said, uh, it's not a big military actor. It's not an economic power in the Middle East. So its influence uh, is decreased uh, it still has uh, some clout, especially when it comes to the uh, narrative uh, through its uh, propaganda or its information campaign in the region. And finally, as I said, the regional powers, and here I, I'm talking mostly about Israel and Gulf states, perceive the U.S. as a defining power. They feel like uh, the U.S. is no longer uh, the... Uh, the uh, superpower able to shape uh, the, uh, the regional uh, I mean, regional gains, and so they see their partnership with China as a leverage. As I said, it's a two-way street. They uh, they will use that partnership also to force the U.S. to be more present and to uh, accept their own demands. So what this means is that. We will see more and more a volatile uh, environment in the Middle East. It's going to be probably uh, uh, more certain uh, than before, but uh, probably for us, uh, for the discussion, it's probably more exciting in a sense. I'll stop here. Uh, we have, I think, here about 20 minutes for the uh, Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, John Lu, for your wonderful presentation, which you expertly synthesize uh, the positions, the postures, and the important personalities of the external powers in the region, the Middle East. Um, now we have arrived at the Q&A segment, so I would like to invite those physically present in the room to uh, pose your questions. Uh, we can, of course, hand you the mic and you can ask John Lu directly. And also, I'd like to invite those uh, who are online on Zoom to type in your questions in the chat box so that we can address them as well. Uh, while everyone, those online and then physically present are putting on their thinking caps, maybe I will start off the Q&A segment with a couple of questions on my own. Uh, the first question being about you know the influence of China, because I think in one of your slides, you showed that in terms of the arms sales, you know, China does not rank even in the top three uh, you know, amongst clients. So would you say that China's you know, influence is confined or, or limited to the area of commercial interest, the area of economic interest? Well, it's... There, there are several uh, uh, aspects uh, to, to the question of the... Uh, uh, the first one relates to the uh, added value, uh, and at the moment, there's a clear added value uh, of Chinese companies, Chinese products uh, seen from the Gulf when it comes to uh, digital networks, when it comes to infrastructures. Uh, same thing for Israel, uh, they, uh, they go for uh, Chinese operators, uh, mostly for uh, business, uh, business reasons. Uh, the field of arms sales is a bit different because it's it's probably more politicized uh, than uh, other uh, domains, uh, other um, fields of uh, business activity. So at the moment, uh, Gulf states uh, are more and more buying uh, Chinese products uh, such as UAVs and uh, uh, fighter jets. 
And maybe if we uh, look at this uh, breakdown for Saudi Arabia in 2033, so 10 years from now, we may see something different. Maybe we'll see uh, a Chinese presence much bigger. Uh, but that relates also to a, an objective uh, uh, fact, which is that the Chinese military systems uh, do not have the operational uh, attractiveness uh, that uh, the US uh, or uh, European system have uh, for both states. At the end of the day, Gulf states, which spend a lot of money on uh, the military, they still want to have the best product uh, on the market uh, because there's an element of pride. Uh, in Saudi Arabia and UAE apparently want to be able to say, we want to, to buy the F-35, because this is the best fighter jet on Earth, this is the most expensive one, but we have the ability to do that, so we'll do it. And China doesn't have something that could, uh, at least in terms of the uh, operational value, compete with that. So I think this is one of the main reasons why they are not so uh, uh, visible. Uh, so what I, I would say we'll see, at least in the next years, is uh, China being present on some niche capabilities, uh, some elements where the Gulf countries cannot buy from the West. So the US, uh, if the US don't, don't want to sell them ballistic missile, they go to China and so on. Uh, but this this creates a lot of uh, uncertainties because uh, how do you uh, operate when you have uh, U.S. and Chinese products at the same time? This is already an issue in the civilian domain, but in the military domain, this creates a headache uh, for uh, military decision making. But so that's the way I anticipate things for the moment. Thanks, John. Uh, I think as consumers, of course, you want to the best product. To not only on your own usage, but also to show off in, to a certain extent, which brings me to my second question before I open it up to the floor, which is about, you know, continuing from what you, you answered earlier, uh, to talk about Europe's, uh, European countries' sales, arm sales to, to, to the Middle East. And in your slide, the same slide that showed the numbers, uh, France and the UK uh, were both important suppliers. And France, of course, historically has also been uh, helping Israel with, with that industry, with military domain as well. So, how would you characterize the role of both France and Britain in this case? Thank you very much, Clemens. Uh, it's so generous from you uh, in a lecture on great power competition to discuss the European, the old European powers. Uh, and, uh, but it's, what's interesting here is that one thing which I argue uh, sometimes in, uh, in discussions on the uh, US-China competition and how uh, the US uh, is losing uh, influence in the Gulf is that the country that at the moment, for instance, is gaining uh, from that is not China, it's actually countries like France. The UAE uh, didn't uh, replace uh, U.S. Uh, fighter jets because I don't know if you're familiar with the crisis. 2021, uh, UAE was supposed to uh, uh, buy uh, U.S. Uh, fighter jet uh, F-35. This was part of the, the deal after the Abraham Accords. But the U.S. Uh, put constraints on the uh, uh, on the Emiratis, saying that yeah, you have to clarify your relations uh, with China. As a result, the, the negotiations were suspended because the UAE didn't want to uh, uh, comply with U.S. demands on its partnership with China. But as a result, uh, the UAE also announced that it would buy 80 uh, French uh, fighter jets. So what's interesting is that that didn't lead UAE to uh, buy uh, Chinese fighter jets. That led UAE to choose what I think is a, a compromise. They went for a European uh, partner. It might annoy uh, Washington, but it doesn't annoy Washington as much as if it was uh, with China. So 
What's interesting is that uh, the crisis between U.S. and Middle Eastern countries mm -hmm. is in some way uh, benefiting uh, for uh, the uh, European countries. So that's uh, the reality. After that, as you mentioned, there's an historical dimension. European countries, and in particular France and the UK, uh, have always tried as much as possible to remain relevant in that area. This is mostly about arms sales. It's mostly about sustaining defense industries in Europe that would not be able to survive if there wasn't Gulf consumers. But apart from that, the diplomatic presence of those countries is uh, declining. Uh, a country like France uh, still has ambitions uh, with regards to Lebanon, but President Macron was not able uh, two years ago when uh, there was the, uh, three years ago when there was the, uh, the explosion of the port in Lebanon and uh, President Macron tried to uh, uh, to lead an initiative uh, to support uh, the, the Lebanese. That, that failed after two months. And since then, there has not been uh, any new initiative. So that, I think, reveals also uh, the fact that, as, as I said, uh, sadly, uh, as a European, uh, Europeans are no longer really a major player in this uh, competition. Thanks, John Lu. Uh we had questions coming in online, uh, but I'd like to open it up to the floor first because you guys have taken the time and effort to come all the way here. So I guess you should have some sort of privilege to ask some questions. So I'm opening up to those who are physically present to, to ask your questions. And I see one taker. I shall please. So thank you very much for a very insightful presentation. Um, so, um, on the declining focus of the US in the region and the increasing uh, strategic interests of the China in the region, we have seen, as Carl also mentioned, uh, an emerging architectures, regional architectures in the region. One of them is the, uh, the, the one that is mediated by China between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Uh, and on the other hand, we have uh, also maybe as the US is playing a, a balance, um, an offshore balance uh, role uh, in the region. Uh, we see the, probably there is an expansion of the universe who I get to join the Akraham Accord. Um, so my question as these two, uh, you know, um, go to develop more and more, do you think? That's going to create more of alignment or division in uh, the region. Thank you very much, Nisha. Uh, good question. It's a it, it's a big question. The um, and that that relates to the fact that uh, Middle Eastern countries uh, at the moment are using that competition as leverage. Uh, and you mentioned alignment. I think what the Middle Eastern countries are doing. Uh, and in, in a way, it's inspired, I would say, by India, is multi-alignment. Uh, they are trying not to uh, side uh, with the US or with China, but they will participate to any initiative uh, that they consider maybe in their interest. Uh, so uh, UAE will uh, be part of uh, the uh, I2U2 initiative, so the uh, Israel Israel, India, UAE, uh, US initiative. At the same time, we'll maintain close ties uh, with China, announcing military drills, signing a, a lot of uh, business deals. Uh, and what, what's interesting is that at the moment, the US is trying to maintain its leadership through these initiatives, through these uh, so called unilaterals. Uh, there is an element of contradiction here because the U.S. on one hand wants to reduce its presence, but at the same time uh, does not really accept uh, more agency to the regional uh, actors. So anytime uh, there's UAE, Saudi Arabia announcing uh, ambitions, diplomatic ambitions with China on any type of initiative, these create anxieties in Washington. And the problem is that you cannot have it both ways. You cannot reduce your presence, expect that uh, the partners in the region will still follow your lead, 
Uh, no, there's, and I think the, the problem is that no politician right now can uh, uh, go on a report in Washington and say, we will accept that our close partners uh, have relations with uh, China. So at the moment, uh, I think it's uh, for the, the, the global actors, uh, a game of multi-alignment. They will participate to anything they can. But I suspect this cannot last too long because a lot of these initiatives, probably historically, they, we, we know that a lot of these initiatives tend to uh, uh, banish when people just realize that beyond uh, ministerial meetings of one or two days where people shake hands and it's just a photo op, nothing happens. I think at the moment uh, there's no big conflict in the region, so uh, it's convenient, but I suspect that if we have the discussion again in uh, five years from now, things may be uh, different and the multi-alignment may prove its uh, limitations. Thank you. Uh, does anyone have a question? No, please. Uh, thank you for the speech. No, I just have one question. So, uh, in the speech you mentioned about how the US and China, they have, and the US have more soft power, they have more military power, they have more diplomatic power over the Middle East than China does. But for some reason, the public opinion seems to greatly favor China over the US. So, do you think there are some, like, other factors, like, uh, unique to the Middle East that cause this, or like, what are the what well, causes the public opinion to be so biased against the US and so favorable to China? I, I think it's uh, it's a combination of different elements. I think it it relates to uh, the, uh, the legacy of US interventions in the region uh, more than uh, the, uh, the the Arab knowledge of uh, China. Uh, because the, to be fair, I think that the, the knowledge on China is uh, limited because the Chinese presence, physical presence, cultural presence uh, is uh, is uh, extremely limited. So uh, there is the idea that China it is a benign power, it will not interfere in the region. Uh, so that that is as far as they, uh, they will understand that Chinese uh, policy. And with regards to the U.S., uh, we have to keep in mind the, the fact that U.S. interventions in the Middle East, most recently with Iraq, well, uh, over, I mean, there's a long history of U.S. interventions in the Middle East starting in the Cold War uh, that, that, that still play a role. And that, uh, that relates, for instance, to uh, uh, the Arab perception that the U.S. is uh, uh, completely biased on Palestine, that the U.S. systematically supports Israel, uh, that the U.S. has been supporting authoritarian regimes in the region historically. Uh, and as if uh, we'd be able to talk about the Iranian perception, the fact that uh, the U.S. Uh, toppled uh, the uh, only uh, democratic uh, system that uh, was created in Iran in the 50s. And that still until today uh, plays a role in the uh, perception. So, uh, I would argue that this, this view is more about the legacy of U.S. interventions, uh, in the region than about, uh, a strong understanding of what would be, uh, what would be Chinese leadership in the region. And that's also probably the, the reason why we, we cannot really, we cannot look at this, uh, these, uh, uh, these indicators, the same way we would be able to do that for Southeast Asia, which obviously has a better knowledge culturally, historically, of uh, China's presence. Thank you again, Chandu, for your uh, amazing uh, presentation. The, the point that you mentioned about uh, U.S. and Israel, really special relationship, uh, it's good that, that you mentioned that U.S. and China actually recognize U.S. Uh, is a big word to you, especially in the wider um, in Muslim community, Islamic community, it's a little, a little less known fact because they mostly consider Israel as a U.S. baby. It's very good that you have mentioned that. I wanted to know from you more on that, especially uh, you said that after 48 and 
mid sixties, uh, you know, during sixties, it started taking interest. What exactly uh, was that uh, attraction that you saw in Israel uh, because of which it was a change of heart? If you could answer that, thank you. Well, there were several elements. The uh, and that that started really in the, the sixties, and the first president that qualified that relationship as a special relationship was Kennedy. Uh, and I think there were elements of um, ideological and uh, elements and interest. Uh, ideology, because there was the perception, the idea that Israel is a democracy. Uh, plus, there was uh, the, the Zionist project itself, the fact that this was about creating a homeland uh for a population that had been suffering from persecution in the western world so that that played a role the fact that uh there was a cultural tie plus the fact that there was a, a political system that the, uh, the us would consider uh compatible with its own uh beliefs this idea that israel is the only democracy in the middle East. and until today that's that plays a role uh, there's also an element of interest, the fact that uh, Israel was considered as a uh, uh, stepping stone or let's say an anchor, an anchor of uh, Western interest vis-a-vis -vis the USSR in the Middle East. Uh, that, that played a role, the fact that at that time uh, the US considered uh, it can rely on Turkey, can rely on Israel, the Arab world at that time was heavily uh, supported by the USSR. Uh, Egypt, uh, under Nasser, was uh, was perceived as a Soviet satellite. It was more complex than that, but the US perceived that uh, Egypt was controlled uh, by the Soviet Union. So Israel, there was an interest in the sense that uh, this, this was a partner, not only a democratic partner, but a strategic uh, partner. So I think that explains until today uh, this uh, uh, this partnership. Eventually, I think the the reason why until today you have such a strong commitment uh, from the U.S. to Israel, the only way, and this is a long debate, uh, we will we'll be able to discuss that when we discuss Israel. But I think it it's also it, it cannot be just about interest. It's about a strong belief in the uh, U.S. political establishment uh, that it's a moral obligation for uh, the U.S. to support Israel. And that's the reason there's no serious debate uh, about um, cancelling uh, that military aid. Uh, apart from some uh, members of Congress on the left, uh, but it's a mi minority. The majority of uh, the political establishment is uh, supportive of that uh, military commitment. And I think it's not, cannot just be explained by interest, it's about beliefs. Thank you, John. And thank you for the question from the floor. We'll try to, in the interest of time, we'll try to synthesize the questions that are coming in from, on, from, from Zoom. So um, let me put these two questions together. It's about U.S. policy uh, in the region. And uh, the first part to it is, what kind of strategic interests will force the U.S.'s hand in terms of favoring one country over another in the region? And the second part is about uh, the difference in Middle East policy between the Biden and Trump administrations. If there's any OK, uh, so very quickly, uh, and because we're running out of time, uh, the U.S. interest, as I said, uh, uh, it's about uh, first and foremost uh, the security of Israel. So, if there's any uh, a country that is perceived as compromising that security of Israel, uh, the U.S. Uh, at the moment uh, will uh, will not, for instance, sell weapons or will not uh, create uh, strong ties. Uh, so that, that is uh, one of the elements. The other elements is uh, stability of the region. The U.S. at the moment is a status quo power. It is not trying to change the Middle East. It may have been this ambition uh, in the early stages of the Bush administration, but since then, it's a rather conservative uh, power, trying 
uh, to uh, maintain the status quo. And that's the reason, for instance, they don't want Iran to have nuclear weapons, among other reasons, but because that would completely change the balance of arms. Uh, the second question was related uh, to Biden and Trump. Uh, and with regards to Biden and Trump, the same thing about Obama, as I said, uh, the substance doesn't really change. Uh, if you look at the Biden administration in the Middle East, uh, Biden didn't uh, go back on the decision to relocate the embassy of the U.S. to Jerusalem. He didn't uh, challenge that. Uh, he, they may uh, at first uh, uh, consider that the Abraham Accords was a legacy of the Trump administration, so they didn't really like to talk about it. But what they are doing right now with Saudi Arabia is exactly the continuation of what Trump started. Uh, the reluctance to uh, invest on uh, the Israel-Palestine conflict and to only focus on Israel's uh, security is also something very similar to Trump. But that's, as I said, because there was already a level of continuation with Obama. Uh, but clearly, this this is because more broadly, more deeply, there's uh, uh, a lack of interest or um, uh, a desire of the uh, U.S. policy establishment uh, to reduce its presence from the region. They just don't know how actually to uh, uh, to materialize that. One final question to wrap up today's discussion is a very broad one, and perhaps we we'll just get your two cents on this. Uh, so. It's all about interest, great power interest in terms of their involvement in the Middle East. And oil was once upon a time that sought after kind of resource and became an interest by, by the great power. So what would you say is, is the main interest today by the great powers or, or external powers? In the Middle East? Yes. Uh, well, I mean, uh, and uh, Carl already uh, touched upon this, the fact that uh, there's an economic interest, obviously, the, the oil, uh, the energy uh, dimension, the fact that we cannot ignore uh, in today's global environment the energy from the Middle East, even more now that uh, the Russian uh, markets uh, are uh, close to a lot of uh, countries. Uh, but in addition to that, there's a security dimension. Uh, in the, uh, in the call, I think I said that in a different way, but uh, uh, you may not care about the Middle East, but the Middle East cares about you. Uh, and uh, usually uh, uh, we see that, uh, we saw that uh, with the, the um, interventions in the 2000s. The Bush administration at first, in, when the Bush administration arrived in Washington, they didn't want to talk about interventions in the Middle East. Bush uh, team had one uh, keyword that was China. Uh, it was supposed to be about all about China. Uh, but 9-11 happened, and then suddenly it was all about the Middle East. Uh, my, my personal uh, belief that I'm um, working on the Middle East, so my bias is that this will happen again, that uh, at the moment they want as much as possible to ignore the Middle East, but there will be a regional crisis again. Uh, my bet would be on uh, a crisis with Iran. Uh, and suddenly people will refocus on the Middle East, not because there's passion uh, for the region, unfortunately, but because of the necessity. With that, we come to the end of today's session, and I thank my colleague John Lu for his presentation and for taking all the questions very patiently, and also to everyone physically here for attending the session, and all those online who have tuned in, thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you next Thursday again for lecture number two, which is on Iran and uh, Arab relations, a regional alignment, which will be presented by my colleague sitting in Asin, alongside someone from someone based in Italy as well. So John Lu will return uh, for another episode, but that will be after the second lecture. So see you then, and thank you very much again.